Okie dokie then, so we are now on part six of my series, The Gods of the Bible, and um, this is part six, so if you haven't seen parts one, two, three, four, five, um, you can still watch this, but I recommend that you watch them because they're all very different, and I'm taking you through a journey um, of the Bible, and we're looking at things in a different light, and looking at things a little differently and these are the things that I'm saying that you will not hear on the from the pulpit you know these are the things that the um, that the pastors and the ministers or whatever titles that they that they have these are the things they don't want you to know and um, so it's been a very interesting series and we're going to talk in part six about um, UFOs in the Bible so it's gonna be interesting um, yes, there are UFOs in the Bible, so I believe, and I'm not alone, there's many people that do. So you draw your own conclusion as we go through the scriptures, uh, you draw your own conclusion as to um, whether you perceive the scriptures to be, to be describing a UFO. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, I've got a few notes to get through. Um, right, so the million dollar question, okay, is... Um, and lots of people are asking this, you know, Christians and non-Christians alike, um, <clears throat> any, anyone, uh, why does God allow bad things to happen and why does God allow suffering to take place? Uh, there's so much debate on that one question. Um, and really, it, you know, it kind of, it determines whether someone believes or not believes. Okay, so let's address that question. Well, um, we've seen from my previous videos, parts one through to five, okay, I mean, it says that God is love. Um, you may doubt that when you read all the scriptures that I've uh, referenced to, you know, so, uh, so there's that, you know, does God love humanity, okay, as much as the... Uh, churches that preach Christianity would have you believe, okay? Uh, also, is it possible that um, God wants to intervene but can't? Is that possible? Well, you see, if God cannot intervene, then we have to question, is God actually omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient? All right, now... Omnipotent means all-powerful, omnipresent, everywhere, all at once, and omniscient, all-knowing. You know, God claims of himself in the Bible that he is. Is that so? Well, I see evidence in the Bible that God is not those things, okay? There's so many uh, reasons, um, just a few off the top of my head. Uh, so God, he would walk with Adam. Right. If you just very early on in the Bible, we can see that God used to come down and 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 hang out with Adam on the earth in the in the cool of the evening. It says that in the Bible. Okay. So um, you know, so that suggests that God is a human. Okay, which we would suspect anyway, because it says in the Bible that that God created man in His image and likeness. So you know, it would seem obvious that we look just like God. Okay, we've got God's DNA, which uh, incidentally I believe is um, we're, we're, a hybrid, we're a hybrid race of um, part gods, you know, not or a race of beings that claim to be gods, you know, not. You see, the God of the Bible didn't create mankind. They and I say they because it's plural. We're going to go into that in a minute. They engineered mankind, right? They they created man in his image and likeness. Man already existed. Okay, so maybe he they took some Neanderthal beings and um, created a hybrid between the Neanderthals and um, the Elohim, the extraterrestrials, the gods that they um, posed as to the human race. We're going to go into all this in more detail in just a moment. Okay, so um, so God used to um, walk with Adam. So uh, now. The, the thing is, okay, he also, when Adam sinned, okay, according to the Bible, he came down and he, he had to look, for, he called out to them, he says, where are you? 
yeah okay so why didn't he know why did he have to call out to them and he was basically looking for them okay so he wanted to talk to them okay so uh so there's that and then of course um there was the time when god came down to investigate the tower of babel okay why did he need to come down there's many occasions in the bible where god came down to carry out some work or do some stuff or look for things or whatever you know so um so i would wonder then is is God omnipresent, omnipotent, um, uh, um, I can't, can't pronounce that one. Okay, anyway, so 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 you would wonder those things. Okay, so what we're going to look at is this whole video is about UFOs in the Bible. Okay, so why would God, right, need a vehicle, right? Why would He need a vehicle? Okay, so the fact that He would need a vehicle, if it is right that He has a vehicle, okay, would suggest that. He's extraterrestrial with limitations and he's not all powerful. Okay. Right, so So I believe that God is, is simply a supreme being, right? The God of the Bible is a supreme being. He's of a more advanced race, an extraterrestrial race, okay? On a power trip. And uh, I'm gonna give you um some evidence here from the Bible. Okay, uh, but surely, if God is more advanced and more evolved than <laughs> the human race, and if he's a supreme being, then would that not make him more selfless and peaceful and loving? Would that not, you know, if you're more evolved, would you not be like, oh well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of better than that. I'm not, I'm not into killing people. I'm not into hurting people. I'm, I'm all. You know, I've learned I, as the as the millennia has gone on, I've I've evolved and you know become such so knowledgeable, etc. Well, you know what? Not necessarily true. Okay, because let's look at nature. Okay, let's look at um, predators and prey. In many cases, predators are more intelligent than their prey, um, and you know they they not only eat them but they play with them and they torture them okay like the cat and the mouse and you know you see it all the time in nature yeah so like you know and, and also within humanity as well if you look through the ages you know where more advanced civilizations have invaded and um you know not only invaded but done very cruel things to fellow humans who are less advanced yeah so so we see that all the time <clears throat> so let's not assume that an extraterrestrial race that is more advanced is going to be loving and kind now i believe that there are tons of loving and kind extraterrestrial races out there um and you know they're looking after us got their eye on us protecting us okay but don't assume that every more advanced race is, is going to be benevolent. Okay. So another example is like a fish and fishermen. Okay. So fishermen, they go fishing. The fishermen are like supreme beings as far as the fish are concerned. They're in a different, ball, they're in a different league. All right. They're even outside of the fish's universe. The fish's universe is like the water. Yeah, so the fisherman is out of the water, he's like in another realm, and he's far more advanced, okay? And, um, yeah, is the fisherman loving and kind, and, well, no, he's fishing to catch the fish to eat him, or her, whatever the case may be. Okay, so, yeah, so let's address this he thing. I keep saying he, it's like habits, okay? So it's, it's actually they, right? When, when we're talking about the God of the Bible, it's they. The Elohim is plural for the gods, okay? Um, so we should be saying uh, the gods of the Bible. Um, so we see plurality all the time in the Bible where it refers to God. Uh, so it's not just the word God itself that suggests plural, uh, well, it doesn't suggest it is plural, okay? But um, also, you know, where, where God makes statements like, uh, let us create man in our image. We're talking about a plural, which the church interprets as being, well, that's the Holy Trinity. But, you know, there's no such mention in the Bible of like, well, when we say we, we mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you know? 
uh, just says we and our. So there is obviously more than one. Okay, maybe there's a chief, the, the the big guy in charge. You know, like the the the, the sort of king of the gods, the king of kings and lord of lords. You know, maybe Jehovah. You know, Yahweh. You know, may, maybe that was the case. But we're talking about a race of gods. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So, <clears throat> yeah, so it seems that God needs a vehicle, and now we're going to get straight into that. So, um, basically, well, there's a ton of scriptures here, we're going to start going through them now, uh, where God's spaceship is cloaked in a rain cloud, okay? And um, we see this in modern times. You see, right, here's the very interesting thing, okay? Whenever, whatever scriptures I'm going to bring up now, the things that are described that suggest that it's a vehicle that is being spoken of, we're not, it's not just okay. Well, first of all, right? Let's just get this. Let's just get this out there right away before we go into this. Okay, all right. So there's congruency because every ancient writing, right? Some of them blatantly say flying vehicles, right? You see the ancient, um, like the Hindu religion. Okay, it's very, very, um, like. Stating it as it is, a flying vehicle, okay? There's drawings, thousands of years old, of flying saucers, yeah? Flying machines, right? There's drawings all over the planet from different time periods of ancient times, right? There, 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 there is in all the ancient religions um, about these spaceships, okay? And flying vehicles that the gods would travel about in, okay? Um, so, so this this is not going to be a shock that there's UFOs in the Bible, okay? Um, so, so yeah. So the rain. Oh yeah, the the other thing. So I just just one last thing before we go into it is okay. So ancient times, it's congruent with ancient times, but not only that, with modern times. Okay, everything we're reading about. If you search on the internet, okay, you will find. That there are modern day accounts described very similar to the Bible. Okay, and you've got to remember the language of the Bible time people, they wouldn't describe things in terminology that we would. They wouldn't say flying saucer and spaceship, and there was no, spe well, maybe there was space travel. There was certainly space travel in ancient times. Whether there was any space travel in Bible times, I don't know. Um, but uh, anyway, they would use different terminology, different ways of describing things. That's why Jesus' parables are so um, kind of strange, because he was relating to his audience in his day, using language and scenarios that they would relate to and understand and identify with. He was talking to lots of farmers and that kind of thing. You know, we would like maybe um, describe things in parables today, and we would talk about perhaps the uh, the city and city life and 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 you know. Businesses and what have you. Okay. So anyway, let's just get right into the scriptures here. So first of all, we're going to look at Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, and I'm going to link you to all the scriptures. Okay. So Exodus chapter 13 and verse 21, it reads, "And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them." the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of cloud by the day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Okay, now, when I first read that scripture, so I've known about it for many years, I thought it's obviously describing a volcano, because at night, you're going to see a pillar of fire. You can see the lava. In the day, the smoke from the volcano is going to be visible. So it would be obvious that in the day you've got smoke, and in the night you've got fire. Case closed. It's a volcano. Okay? I thought that. But if you really look at this, it's completely not. All right? Now, let's read Exodus chapter 14 and verse 19. And this is going to tell you why it's not a volcano. And the angel of God went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. 
and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. And it came to pass that the morning, that in the morning, watch the Lord looked into the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud, and troubled the host of the Egyptians, and took off their chariot wheels, and they drave them heavily. So the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. Okay, so just just to describe this, so what's happening here this pillar of smoke and pillar of fire is moving around strategically, okay? So if a volcano, you know, you've got a volcano, it's stationary, okay? Um, the, the pillar of fire is, is going to be in the same place day and night. There's no moving around. Um, this is moving around. So, so it's obviously not a volcano, okay? It's moving around intelligently. You know, it's going to very specific places for a specific purpose, you know, to aid the uh, allies and to uh, hinder the enemy. So what is it then? Well, if we continue examining the scriptures, then, um, and we join the dots, then we will find that, you know, if you draw the same conclusion as me, that there's UFOs in the Bible. Okay. So, um, what are the names of the spaceships? Well, I reckon that one of the names of the spaceships is called the Glory of the Lord. Okay, that's a term used for a UFO. So, let's look at Exodus chapter 16 and verse 10. Um, and it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud okay so it's not just the clouds there's something in the cloud okay again check out modern day experiences where we often have testimonies of ufos cloaked in a cloud okay right so you know any one of these scriptures by themselves don't hold much weight but we're going to look at a whole lot more okay so let's look at exodus chapter 19 and verse 9 and the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. Okay, so God is saying, I come to you in a thick cloud. Why is he coming to people in a thick cloud? Well, let's, let's we'll, we'll, we'll go into that in a moment, but there is a reason, okay? Um, so that was Exodus 19 and verse 9. So let's read Exodus 19 and verse 16. So it's just a few verses on. Okay. Um, and it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. Now that to me sounds like a gigantic spaceship that was so great that and had such such powerful thrusters or whatever. Now I don't believe that all spaceships are, have propulsion systems, you know. Um, but you've got to remember, we, there's various civilizations in the universe of varying um, advancements technologically, and there's maybe some extraterrestrial races, especially those that don't come so far to come and visit us that maybe do use propulsion systems. If you're coming many, many billions of light years, then you need to use stargates, wormholes, whatever, uh, you know, interdimensional, whatever, you know, sort of thing. But anyway, so um, 
yeah, it sounds to me that that's the case. I mean, you know, what do you read into that? You know, okay. So there's a lot of noise in that scripture. It's a lot of noise, a lot of fear, a lot of trembling. You know, it's uh, you know, smoke, fire. You know, it just sounds like a classic uh, rocket type thing to me. Okay, so uh, let's read a few verses on in verse 21. We're still in Exodus chapter 19. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mount, and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou, and Aaron with thee. And let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. Okay, now this is interesting, and I'll tell you why. We already know from various scriptures throughout the Bible that God has indeed come and physically interacted with mankind from the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis. We've already discussed that. There's no danger with coming face to face with God. There's evidence in the Bible of that. Okay, but here God is very clear, don't let them come to me. It sounds very much to me, you know, this whole sanct be sanctified, you know, is there protective clothing needed? I mean, you know, you've got all these religious things going on. It's very specific. You've got to wear certain stuff. You've got to proceed in a certain manner. You know, don't let any, you know, only a select few that maybe are briefed on the protection thing. And like the masses can't come. It sounds to me like there's radiation trouble. There's like, um, you know, there's, there's like various dangers of approaching this spacecraft, you know, and, um, you know, you have to be sanctified. You have you've got to wear protective garments. I mean, there certainly was um, garments um, that the priests would wear. And, um, yeah, so that's how it sounds to me. I mean, you know, God is very, um, very you know, numerous times, you know, saying about people. And people have died by coming too close to uh, uh, God's spaceship, you know. Okay, so there's actually going to be more on that as we progress. So that was 19 and 21. Okay, so now let's look at um, Exodus chapter 33 and verses 9 through to 11. Okay, uh, 33, 9. Okay, so, and it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended. Okay, now I'm going to stop reading. Okay, so I'm just going to comment there. Okay, yet more evidence that this cloudy pillar was not a volcano. Okay, all right, now this is another occasion, okay, and a cloudy pillar has descended for a reason. It's intelligently controlled. It's not a volcano, okay? Okay, so um, let me start again. So it came to pass, and Moses entered into the tabernacle. The cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshipped, every man at his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face. And a man speaketh unto his friend, and turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. So what? So he died? I don't know. But anyway, so yeah, do you know what? Moses speaking to God face to face, and yet yeah, it says in the Bible as well, no man at any time has ever seen God. I think that I think that's in John, if I remember rightly. But it says that in, in the New Testament that no man has ever seen God. And yet clearly in the Old Testament there's numerous times where um I mean there was a man that wrestled with God. Okay. So um yeah, so Moses has seen God um face to face. Um so anyway. But we digress, a little off topic there. Okay, so let's go to um, Exodus chapter 34 and verse 5. 
and the Lord descended in a cloud and stood there with him, or stood with him there, it's funny language in the Bible, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So, you know what? We're seeing more and more evidence all the time, numerous times, repeatedly throughout the Bible, that God is a human or a humanoid. He comes and he stands and he talks and it's face to face. And, you know, God looks just like us or we look just like God, whichever way you want to put it. Right? So God is a being. Yeah. And um, so there you go. And he travels. He's a being who is not magical. Right. He's not magic. He doesn't fly around like Superman and just disappear and reappear and do what he wants because he's all powerful, omnipresent. He travels in a cloud. Right. Not as a cloud. OK, he's not traveling as a cloud. He travels in a cloud. All right. In a cloud. OK. And there's more of that um, about that momentarily. OK, so I'm going to show you now in the next verse that his spaceship is a solid object. OK, so when I'm saying that he travels in a cloud, I'm serious. Right. There is a spaceship that is in disguise as a cloud. OK, and we know that from Exodus chapter 40 and verse 34. So it says, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord. Right. Meaning his spaceship filled the tabernacle. OK, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Okay, he, so Moses couldn't, and this is me talking now, not reading. Okay, so um, Moses couldn't enter because of the cloud. Okay, so he obviously hit like a brick wall, so to speak. You know, he, he hit a solid object, he could not enter because of it. Okay, now we're going to read on. So we're now in verse 36. So it's Exodus chapter 30, verse 36. And the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle. The children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was in on, on it by night in the sight of the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So yet again, we see that this pillar of fire and smoke by day, the, the, the cloud, these are not things of nature. These are intelligently moving around. So when God wants his people to move, he moves in the direction that he wants them to go. When it's time for them to stop and camp for a while, it stops. You know, so so this is very it's intelligently controlled, um, a solid object. And uh, so there you go. It's not a, it's not a volcano because uh, I was convinced for a long time that it was describing a volcano. But no, I mean, I don't know how I couldn't see it but anyway. So now we're going to look at Leviticus and um, and when people used to die when they got too close to God's spaceship. OK, so Leviticus chapter 10 and verse one, um, it says, and Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Okay. So, the, the whole, what we were discussing earlier, about protective clothing, you know, being sanctified, that's another way of saying, like, you protect yourself. Uh, but, of course, you know, they wouldn't have known this language back then. Not in the same way. You know, they knew what they were doing. They just didn't, they just didn't describe it in the way that we would describe it today. So let's read um, uh, Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 1. Okay. Right. 
So now we're going to be introduced to another name for God's spaceship. He calls it the mercy seat. Okay. And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not all the times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Okay. So God is coming in a cloud, and yet again, he is not a cloud, he is in the cloud on an object. This time he's talking about a mercy seat. We're talking about a solid object that God is traveling on. God needs transport, okay? And also, just before I continue on, I just, just a thought I've had. I mean, you know, I said in my previous videos, we've been doing this series now, and in previous videos we've been talking about all the killings of God. And I think that, um, yeah, God has, like, been very, um, you know, ruthless and uh, tyrannical and, you know, uh, killed people, uh, innocent people, children, women, children. We're not going to all of that because we've already discussed all of that. But I think in many cases... Like where his own people were concerned, where God has come to the tabernacle and like he's appeared in his spaceship and all that, and a lot of people have died, and and I think that in those cases it was not intentional. He killed his own people that were working for him. I mean, who would kill people that were working for them? Okay, um, you know those were genuine deaths because of the uh, the whole, you know, God, you know, yet again evidence that he's not like he can't. He's not all powerful, you know what I mean? You know, yeah, people can die by accident in God's presence, you know, and he can't prevent it because he's a human, yeah? He, God is a human, but he's a lot, lot older than us and he's a lot more advanced and he's more supreme and, you know, um, which is why he's in the position he's in. Okay. So, that was... um. Leviticus 16.1. Okay, so um, let's look at Numbers um, chapter 9, verse 15, on a few verses. Okay, so, um, and on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony, and at even, which is even, evening, uh, there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. So it was always. The cloud covered it by day, and in the appearance of fire by night. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed, and in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. At the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed. And at the commandment of the Lord, they pitched. Okay, so this is what I was saying earlier. They were, they were, they were like journeying and stopping as God commanded. They were following a spaceship. Okay, as long as the children, sorry, as long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. And when the cloud tarried along, Upon the tabernacle many days, then the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord, and journeyed not. And, it, and so it was, when the cloud was a few days upon the tabernacle, according to the commandment of the Lord, they abode in their tents, and according to the commandment of the Lord they journeyed. And so it was, when the cloud abode for even, from even until the morning, that the cloud was taken up in the morning, and they journeyed. Hmm. Whether it was by day or by night that the cloud was taken up, they journeyed. Sounds like I'm repeating myself, but it's the scriptures that are repeating itself. It seems to have said the same thing for about ten sentences now. Um, or whether it were two days or a month or a year that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle remains thereon. The children of Israel abode in their tents and journeyed not. But when it was taken up, they journeyed. Okay, sounds like that could have been said in just a few words, but anyway. 
Um, so that was Numbers uh, chapter 9 and verse 15 through to uh, 22. Okay, so Numbers chapter 10 and verse 11. And it came to pass on the 20th day of the second month in the second year that the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle of the testimony. And the children of Israel took their journeys out of the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud rested in the wilderness of Paran. Uh, pa yeah, Paran, Paran. And the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day when they were out of the camp. And it came to pass, when the ark was set forward, that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let, um, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. Yeah. So, um, sounds as though... <clears throat> From this scripture that God would use his spaceship to terrorize the enemy and send them scattering and fleeing and then he'd go back to the camp. Okay so that was Numbers chapter 10 and verse 11. So um, I'm going to show you now and we're still in Numbers 11 okay that God's spaceship has weapons okay so let's read from 1 through to uh, well just just from 1 here. Um, and when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them, and consumed them that were in the that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. Okay, so let's just stop there before we read on. Let's have a look at this. So, so the people complained. God was displeased. He didn't like it. It kindled his anger, and fire from the Lord. Now. How in these days, how was God? What was God's presence? I mean, what what was God doing? He was he was in his spaceship in a cloud, right? And at night it would appear like fire. I mean, it was maybe lights, yeah. But to the Israelites, they maybe described it as fire, yeah. Okay, and um, and then fire went out from the Lord and and burned them up. I mean, you know, he's the 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 weapons on this spaceship. He's sending out fire. He's shooting. Shooting down. Huh? Now, let's read uh, verse 2. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Tabara, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. And verse 25, we're just going to skip on to 25. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. Okay. So. Um, now if we go to chapter 12 of Numbers and read verse 5. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. Okay. And they both came forth. In verse 10. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam and behold, she was leprous. Okay, so here's not a case of like, well, these guys were bad and God kind of bestowed a sickness upon them. They were simply in there, close to God's spaceship. But when the spaceship went, like, her skin was as white as snow. And she became leprous. Yeah? And, um, you know, so, yeah, again... This is like showing us that people would get sick around God's spaceship. Maybe they weren't sanctified in that protection. Okay. Right. So. I'm just going to, I'm not going to read these. Okay. But I'm going to show you, I'm going to just give you some more scriptures to look on your own about um, God's spaceship cloaked in a cloud. Okay. 
So Numbers chapter 14 and verse 14, Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 32, Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 11, and Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 15. Okay. So these clouds may not necessarily be the result of combustion. They may be a result of hydrogen drives, which have been described in UFO literature. The clouds may be condensed water vapor, which is a byproduct of the alien's cold fusion energy source. Betty Anderson, or Anderson, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right, described the source of these clouds in detail in Raymond Fowler's book, The Watchers, pages 76 to 78. While under hypnosis, she describes an alien refueling procedure in much the same way that Ezekiel describes uh, his encounter, which we'll discuss a bit later, by the way. Okay? So she quotes, The alien craft is spinning around and around and water with it and what's happening is these silver balls are starting to light up but it looks like that spinning is causing steam or mist all over the all over uh, sending out like clouds or puffs of steam or something and she describes it as being beautiful and she says that there's a bright light right in the spinning part of the center and the steam um, it's like clouds all around and it's causing rainbows and uh, yeah so she just goes on to describe that it's, it's written quite funny because it's a recording of the hypnosis session okay but I'm going to link you to this so you get to see it yourself okay right So let's have a look at 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verses 8 through to 16. So I know there's a lot of scriptures and I know I'm, I, I, this is a very boring video, I know that. Uh, but those of you who are interested in UFOs in the Bible, then, you know, you know, these are the scriptures we have to go through, you know. Um, okay, so 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 8. Then the earth shook and trembled and foundations... The foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wroth. Verse 9. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth. Devoured coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. And he was seen upon the wings of the wind. And he made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomforted them. And the channels of the sea appeared, and foundations of the world were discovered at the rebuking of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. So we're talking about blasts, nostrils, okay, it, uh, trembling. Um, I mean, it just so much, you know, smoke and clouds and honestly, all this stuff, my goodness. You know, this is the way the Bible writer described it, okay. Um, we would describe it differently today, but I mean, what do you get from that other than the fact that it's obviously a spaceship? Yeah, I mean, like the nostrils being like where the, you know, the, the, the thrusters or whatever, it's, you know, it's, it's the, where the smoke is coming out from the propulsion, you know, I mean, I, am I crazy? I, I don't think so. Okay, so, uh, so God uses the cloud all right, the, the the spaceship, I should say, to transport himself or to hide his presence. Okay, so um, there's many scriptures on that. Um, so 
if we read um, Psalm 78 and verse 14, actually we'll not. Well, no, I'll tell you what, I'll read a couple and then I'm just going to quote the rest. Because otherwise it's just going to go on and on and on. And I'm even getting bored myself. Okay, so Psalm chapter 78 verse 14. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud and by night by a light of fire. Psalm 99 verse 7. He spake unto them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. Psalm 104 verse 3. Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot. Okay. Now, uh, that's just saying it right there. He makes the clouds his chariot. He's, he's traveling in the clouds. You know, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. You know, God is flying in the sky in a vehicle. There's so much in the Bible. There's so much in the Bible about this. And I just don't know why the masses don't see this when they read the Bible so much. My goodness. Okay, so Psalm 105, verse 39. He spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give them light in the night. Um, Isaiah, chapter 19, verse 1. The burden of Egypt. Behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud. God is riding in a cloud. Okay, and shall come into Egypt, and the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 44. Thou hast covered thyself with a cloud, that our prayer should not pass through. Okay, so all the time we're seeing in the Bible how God is traveling how does God travel? If God wanted to go from Europe to America to Australia, you know, like you would think an all-powerful, omnipresent God would just be all those places all the time, just appear, disappear, reappear, whatever. Doesn't even have to appear. He just knows everything like Big Brother style, CCTV all over the earth, whatever. Okay. But no, God is traveling. He's traveling. He's in a spaceship and he's traveling. It's, it's so obvious. Okay. I'm not just saying this. This is okay. Right now, let's look at the New Testament. Okay. We're going to look at the, and do you know what? You'll be glad to know we're almost done. Okay. So let's look at the New Testament. Okay. So we're going to read Matthew chapter 17 and verse 1. It's also as well because you know how the Gospels are all like the same, just different writers. Okay. So Matthew 17 verse 1, Mark 9, 2 to 6, and then Luke 9. 28 through to 35. Okay, so we're reading from Matthew. And after six days, Jesus, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and did his face did shine as the sun, and his rain, uh, raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with them. Well, how did they get there? Okay, verse 4. Then answered Peter. <laughs> it sounds like, and I, I was reading, and I said, well, how did they get there? That's not what it says in the Bible, that's me. Okay, but I think you know that. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here... Uh, three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. While, uh, while he yet spoke, spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice came out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And the disciples heard it, and fell on their faces, and were sore afraid. So, New Testament as well, God's traveling in the cloud. Matthew 24, verse 29, and it's as well in Mark 13, 24 through to 26. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. This is a prophecy of the end times, isn't it? And then shall appear the sun, sorry, the sign of the Son of Man 
which is Jesus, in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Matthew 26, verses 64, which is also Luke 21 and 27. Uh, Jesus saith unto them, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Okay? Acts chapter 1 and verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Okay, verse 10. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as they went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go to heaven. I mean, these scriptures I've read, it's all about spaceships, abductions, not unwilling abductions, spaceships, abductions, my goodness, uh, this is what it's all saying. Okay, so there's some scriptures for you. Now, First Thessalonians speaks of the rapture, doesn't it? The word rapture doesn't appear in the Bible, but this is a, a big, you know, Christian doctrine. Is the rapture? One Thessalonians chapter four and verse sixteen: For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, um, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive shall remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and we shall ever be with the Lord okay so we're meeting God in the air all right now how many know that there's nothing in the air heaven is not in the sky all right there's nothing in the sky there's nowhere to like stand and walk about and have a chat in the sky okay there isn't so, like, if there's any such place as heaven, it's going to be off somewhere on another planet or another dimension. Okay, yet we're going to meet God in the sky. It clearly says that. So how are we going to meet God in the sky if it's not in a spacecraft? Okay. So anyway, so that's, so that's that. Um, so there's chariots of fire. Uh, before that, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, this this is this has been one of my favourites for a long time. Revelation, big evidence of a spaceship. Okay, All right. Check this out. Revelation chapter one and verse seven. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Okay, all over the Bible. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. So this is a big spaceship. This is a prophecy of the future, by the way, the vision given to John. So this is coming, this is yet to come, right? yet to be fulfilled. So talk about a massive spaceship, because every eye shall see him. Well, not necessarily, maybe it'll just be broadcast on the news. Oh, by the way, I could talk about this for hours. And do you know what? In this series, right, we're going to, there's going to be more to come, right? It covers a lot. Talking about UFOs and building up to something, right? Because you know what? I'm going to tie this all together. In my later videos, we're going to be tying this all together. We're going to see about why is this all the way it is? What is the agenda, right? Okay? Because you know what? I'll just give you a little snippet, right? The prophecies of Revelation, they will be fulfilled. They're going to be staged. It's going to be a whole false flag thing. The technology exists to do it. Anyway, we're going to go into that later on. I'm not give too much away. Okay, so let's go back to the scriptures. So Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, um, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so. Amen. Now, um, Revelation 11 and verse 12. 
And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. And their enemies beheld them. Right? Revelation 14 and verse 14. And I looked and behold a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the son of man. <clears throat> How is he sitting on a cloud? He's obviously sitting in a chair in a spaceship. Okay. <laughs> now that's not a quote from Revelation 14, by the way. That's me talking. Okay. So now I'll go back to the reading of the scripture. Having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. Um, and verse 15. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, uh, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat in the cloud thrust his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And Revelation chapter 1 verse 2, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. All right? prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, when I say we're going to be really going into this in a later um, video on my series, we're going to be talking about this New Jerusalem, this city New Jerusalem. This is a big subject that I really want to cover, right? Because this city is a spaceship, right? And I won't spoil it, okay? But we're going to go into this. So, um, yeah. So anyway, just a little snippet here. So Revelation 21, he's saying that this city is going to come down to the earth out of heaven. Right? Ah, I can't resist it. I'm going to have to tell you. Right? It's a three dimensional city. It's a cube. Right? And it's coming down out of the sky. And this is a prophecy. And it's going to come down. All right? We're talking about a massive spaceship. All right? Anyway. And then I'll tell you what's going to happen. But we'll, I'm saving that. Subscribe to me and you'll get the. Uh, the notification when that video is done. I'm going to be doing it soon uh, over the next couple of weeks. Okay. So anyway, what about the burning bush, yeah? Like Moses when he saw the burning bush. How was a guy, like, you got a guy, Moses, and he's like, a long time ago, how is he going to describe this thing, this phenomenon that's going on in the wilderness? You know, he's seeing a fire, it's like by a bush, and it's not consuming the bush, it's this strange energy. Yeah, this extraterrestrial energy that he can't describe. Yeah, um, and he, he he says it's a burning bush, and like, and then avoid. You know, I think there was a spaceship involved there. Yeah. So that anyway, if you want to read the burning bush story, you go to Exodus chapter three and verse two. Um. So yeah, so we got chariots of fire. Okay. So two kings, chapter two, verse eleven. And it came to pass as they went. Uh, still went on and talked that behold there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire that departed them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven so there's lots going on there All right so chariot of fire again this is the way the ancients described what they saw yeah um you know so it's a chariot of fire horses of fire so we're always talking about a mothership and little scout ships, yeah. So, so one, one big one and a few little ones. We see all time modern day sightings. And uh, and then Elijah was abducted um, into the spaceship, and they describe that as a whirlwind. How else are they going to describe it? They don't, they don't use words like abducted back then. Maybe they did. I don't know. But anyway, they interpreted it as a whirlwind, and he went up into heaven. Yeah, went up to the sky. Um, probably went into the spaceship, no doubt and was maybe tampered with who knows who knows so we're going to read a very important scripture i'll save the best to last okay so this is like the one of the most famous ufo scriptures in the bible okay and then we're just about done so we're going to go to ezekiel and chapter one and verse four okay and we're going to read through till about verse 28 and i looked and behold a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof was the colour of amber out of the midst of the fire. 
okay? How uncanny does this sound? Just like modern day sightings, okay? So now we're on verse 5. And out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Ah, oh, sorry, I keep stopping my reading. I have to, okay? So these four living creatures, right? Extraterrestrials. We're talking about spaceships, we're talking about extraterrestrials, okay? They're all extraterrestrials. The Elohim are extraterrestrials. The angels are extraterrestrials. The living creatures are extraterrestrials. They all travel around in spaceships. It all adds up. It all makes sense. Join the dots. I mean, this is the way it is, people. You know, this is this is how it is. You know, the gods. They came to Earth. They liked the Earth. They wanted to have the Earth. They wanted to dominate the Earth. There's like wars of various entities and extraterrestrials fighting for dominion of the Earth. Everyone wants to. You know, it's ah. This is this is the way it is. Um, so anyway, so in the midst thereof is the likeness of four living creatures, okay, so they're obviously not humanoid, um, and this, okay, back to reading the scripture, and this was their appearance, they had the likeness of a man, and everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings, and their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of the calf's foot, and they sparkled like the colour of um, burnished brass. brass. Um, and they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward, and as for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, and the face of a lion, and the on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox, and on the left side they four had the face of an eagle. I don't know what this is about. Um I really don't know what this is about, but they're, 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 they're creatures, uh, very strange creatures by the sound of it, but they're creatures. Okay, so verse 11, thus was their faces and their wings were stretched upwards, two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies, and they went every one straight forward, whether, uh, whither the spirit was to go. They went, and they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the colour of beryl, and they four had one likeness. And their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. I'm just going to stop there for a second. Now, are you getting the impression from this that we're talking about a spaceship? And we're talking about many spaceships. And now we're into describing wheels and wheels within a wheel and lightning and fire and moving up and down and... You know, it just sounds so much like a UFO sighting. It was unbelievable. So verse 17. When they, when they went, they went upon their four sides, and they went, and they turned not when they went. And as for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful. And their rings were full of eyes round about them four. Are the eyes the lights around the wheel? I don't know. 
so it sounds like it and verse 19 and when the living creatures went the wheels went by them and when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth the wheels were lifted up uh, with whithersoever the spirit was to go they went thither uh, was their spirit to go and the wheels were lifted up over against them for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels all right and the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over the heads above and under the firmament where the wings um, where their wings straight the one toward the other every one had two which covered on his side on this side sorry and every one had two which covered on that side their bodies and when they went I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters as the voice of the Almighty the voice of speech and the noise of a host when they stood they let down their wings and there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and they let down their wings and above the firmament that was over their heads was the saw uh, sorry was the likeness of a throne and appeared of a sapphire stone and and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of man above upon it and i saw the color of amber as the appearance of fire round about within it from the appearance of his lions even upward and from the appearance of his lions even downward i saw it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness round it so it's very very difficult to read i'm reading like i should have read more of a modern easier read version of the bible i should have but i didn't but anyway we'll continue on it's just what a couple more verses so uh, verse 28 and the appearance of the bow that is in the clouds by the day of rain so was the appearance of the brightness round about this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord and when I saw it I fell on my face and heard a voice of one that spake spake spoke okay and he said unto me son of man stand up upon thy feet and I will speak unto thee okay so uh, my goodness me I mean it's just it's just talking about spaceships isn't it it is I mean how else I have no idea how else to interpret this I mean if you're reading it properly and you're taking it in you're visualizing it as you read it and you know it's describing vehicles in the sky you know in much the same way that modern day UFO sightings are described just in different language okay so Ezekiel 10 and verse 3 now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house and when the man went in and the clouds filled the inner court then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house and the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory and the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh and it came to pass that when he had commanded the man clothed with linen saying take fire from between the wheels and between the cherim the cherubims and he went in and stood beside the wheels these are physical things and one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims unto the fire that was between the cherubims and took thereof and put it into the hands of him that was clothed with linen who took it and went out and there appeared in the cherubims the form of a man's hand under their wings and when i looked upon behold the four wheels 
by the cherubims, one wheel by the cherub, and another wheel by another cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was the colour of beryl stone. Verse 10. And as for their appearances, they four had one likeness, as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides. They turned not as they went, but to the place whither the head looked. They followed it. Then turned not as they went, and their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and the wheels were full of eyes round about. Even the wheels that um, forehead. As for the wheels, it was cried upon them in my hearing, O wheel! And every one had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub, the second face was the face of a man, the third face the face of a lion, the fourth face the face of an eagle. And the cherubims were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river of Shabar. And when the cherubims went, the wheels went by them. And when the cherubims lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also turned not from beside them. When they stood, these stood. And when they were lifted up, these lifted up themselves also. For the spirit of the living creature was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. And the cherubims lifted their, up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels were also beside them, and every one stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the Lord of Israel was over them above. Above. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Cheba, and I knew that they were the cherubims. Every one had four faces apiece, and every one four wings, and the likeness of their hands of a man under their wings, and the likeness of their faces was the same faces which I saw by the river of Cheba their appearances and themselves, they went everywhere <coughs> straight forward. Okay, now then, come on people, we've read two accounts in his equal, well the same account I think, okay, what we're talking about here are wheels, eyes all around the wheels, sounds like waters, I mean like, oh my goodness, you know, okay, so let's just take the, the wheels and the eyes around the wheels, Okay, a wheel is the shape of a saucer, the eyes around the wheels, the lights. How many modern day sightings do we see of like a, like what looks like a wheel in the sky with lights all around it? They're seeing the same thing today as they saw back in the Bible times. And back in the Bible times, they described them what they saw in a particular way, they interpreted what they saw in a particular way. We interpret UFO sightings today the way that we interpret them, you know. So, um, but you know what? Nothing's changed. You know, things happen today the same as they happened way back. It's just we've got different perspectives. Okay. So then, of course, we've got, and this is the final one, so in Genesis 28, verse 10 to 13, I'll not read it, it's the stairway to heaven, where Jacob um, saw a stairway in a dream, I think it was, and um, it was like a ladder, sorry, it was a ladder, and there were beings ascending and descending, okay, the angels of God is described as, you know, um, so, and this is just like a modern day sighting, there's a testimonial here of, um, uh, written in a book uh, called Searchers by Ron Felber, 
and uh, he describes the account given by a married couple on October 21st, 1989. It happened just like um, it's described in Genesis 28, verse 10. So yeah, I'm going to link you to this. Okay, so we finally done it. I knew this was going to be a long one before I started, um, but it, it, it had to be done. I have to like substantiate my claims. You know, I have to. Uh, I can't just say there's UFOs in the Bible. Um, I have to tell you exactly uh, where, um, and then you have that information that you can then look at it and draw your own conclusion. Um, I don't see. You know, when you look at them all, I mean, any one of those scriptures standing alone on their own, uh, you wouldn't think much of it. But um, as we see it coming again and again, and then in certain places, it's obvious that God is flying around. He's up in the sky, um, you know, and like solid object, uh, dangerous objects, people dying, like maybe from radiation. They have to have be protected and all this and and then of course in Ezekiel it's like really obvious wheels in the sky with lights all around which describes his eyes and then like the way that it moves the way that it sounds you know the way that this, as God's ship comes down the way that there's a tremble and there's like sort of lightnings and thunderings and tremblings and the, the thrusters and, and honestly like you know all throughout the Bible all throughout the Bible Okay, and, what, and and how do we know? Well, you know, as we go through this series, what we're beginning to realise is that, like, the God, like the true God who created the universe, right, um, it's not a he or a she, right, it's energy. Energy created the universe. It's never had a beginning. It will never have an end. It's intelligent energy. Um, but like the God of religion, the God of the Bible, the God of the Quran, the God, you know, the gods of religion, they're extraterrestrials. They are extraterrestrials. They're not all powerful. If they were all powerful, they could end the suffering that were on the earth. Now, there are extraterrestrials that do have the ability to end the suffering, but um, there's like a law of non-intervention because, you know, we've got to evolve and work it out ourselves as a species, you know, and like there is help on on, on offer and like you know it's been rejected by the governments because the governments know all about this and you know but anyway we're, we're going into all kinds of different topics that needed to be discussed on their own and you know they, they require a lot of time on their own um but uh, yeah so as we go on through the series i don't know how many parts we're on part six i don't know how many more parts there's going to be but the intention is to like tie this all together like we're describing it all so far what we're going to do is we're going to like you know the, the, the questions are raised like why you know what why why the, the elohim why did they come here why do they do what they do what is their plans what's the agenda for the future what's going on you know so let's find out what's going on and you know who are we you know um are, are we like nothing more than like a genetic experiment uh genetically engineered slave you know slave race is that what we are is that all we are are we anything more than that you know we're, we're going to be looking at all that stuff you know so um thank you for for listening and uh and that's it for today no. <coughs> I don't